Uh, with the election only four weeks out, every morning on the Pacific Breakfast Show, we are looking at the issues, the candidates, the parties, policies, and stories to give you, our Radio 531 PI listeners, as much information to make an informed decision. Uh, come election day, the 23rd of September. Uh, joining me this morning is Gladys Hartson, senior reporter from the Pacific Radio News Room. And a very warm welcome to the show this morning, sister. How are you doing? Very well. Good morning, Brian. And uh, it's Friday. It's always uh, a good thing. So. Oh, yes, yes, yes. It is a good thing. Now, we uh, were expecting and are still expecting a phone call from the uh, leader of the National Party as well as the Prime Minister, the Honourable Leo Luai. I let you more. Uh, Bill English, uh, as yet, uh, no show, but uh, not going to speculate or anything like that. So we will continue as uh, per normal. Gladys, uh, talk to me about the latest uh, updates uh, with regards to, well, everything election-y uh, in, in the countdown to the 23rd of September. Well, uh, four more weeks, you know, uh, highly anticipating just uh, who will govern the... Um the next, uh, oh, I see the phone line is, is going there. And uh, as we uh, continue, very good morning to you, our uh, listeners. And as we were saying, uh, four weeks uh, uh, counting down to the uh, election. And uh, as we've seen, we've seen change of leadership amongst uh, several of our parties. Uh, also, um, shock resignations as well. So, but we've still got four weeks. Um, and uh, good news, I see that uh, voter registration has increased according to Electoral Commission. So that's that, that's good news. But we've also got good news because somebody very special is on the line. Yes, thank you so much for that, Gladys. So thank you for uh, with that little segue <laughs> into the introduction. Uh, this morning we have the first of our interviews with the leaders of our major political parties. This morning we welcome to the show the leader of the National Party and Prime Minister of New Zealand, the Honourable Leo Luai Aleo Tumua, uh, Bill English. A very warm welcome to the show this morning, uh, Prime Minister. Good morning and talo for lover. Talo for lover, indeed. Let's start, uh, Prime Minister, with this. I'd like to read this quote. I, I thought it was very interesting. From 1991, I see myself looking down the barrel of retirement, that's for sure. I've got young kids. Days when someone was in politics for 25 years are over. Back in 1991, uh, 25 years ago. So, first question, no shock resignation for you before the 23rd of September? <laughs> no. <laughs> No, well, the, the the shock resignation on our side was John Key, of course, back in November. Uh, so I hadn't really expected to uh, find myself holding the office of Prime Minister, but uh, you never know how things life's going to turn out. But I have to say, I have really enjoyed it, and I am going to campaign hard, not just to keep the office. There's no point in just having the status. It's uh, so we can get so much more done. Prime Minister, with regards to issues uh, of, of course, focusing on our uh, Pacific community, what have our Pacific communities across the country uh, been saying to you around what are their greatest concerns in the lead-up to Election Day and how you, as the National Party, will address those concerns? Well, their greatest concern is just about the, you know, the pressure, uh, pressure on finance of the household, uh, worries about whether or how the... Uh, uh, young people are going to get into work. Uh, how they can, you know, save enough uh, to cover cover uh, for when things go wrong. There's also alongside that, I think, uh, some quite quite a bit of positivity. More more Pacific people now have jobs and have had, ever had jobs in New Zealand, so that's that's positive. And those opportunities are going to make you know continue uh, to be good good for the both for the parents and or the children. Uh, there's also a high, quite significantly higher level of educational achievement now. Uh, around 80% of all uh, level two applicants for the, in the Pacific are actually getting NCA level two, and that's like the getting to the start line for further training. And the number who leave school with no qualifications has dropped from just under a half to uh, somewhere around a quarter. So there's been some real progress there. Uh, the other day, I just ran into a big group of um, uh, young Pacifica health professionals down in Dunedin, young people training to be nurses and OTs and doctors and things. You just wouldn't find a group like that 10 years ago. So these concerns, though, about the pressures on the household, we want to address those directly. 
Uh, and people need to be aware about the family incomes package and the doctor's visits changes with, that we've made. So on the doctor's visits, if you've got a, you know, a, an older retired Pacifica couple, but they happen to live in a part of town which isn't, uh, doesn't have a whole lot of low-income people, they have missed out on having $18 GP visits. And we just announced the other day that uh, if they're on the if they on the community services card that is just living on national super, then it doesn't matter which clinic they go to, they will still get the free doctor's visits. And with the family incomes package, you know we recognise this Pacific families who have come under real pressure because of the rising rentals uh, and just the day-to-day costs. So from the first of April next year, uh, their tax will come back a little bit. So if they're on, you know, earning 50000 that's worth about $20 a week to them. Uh, they'll get higher child payments, and that means for the first child it'll go up um, by the by 18 or $28 a week to somewhere around 90 to $100 per week per child. And then the single, I think the single biggest thing that will make a difference is that the accommodation supplement that people get hasn't actually been adjusted since 2006. And we're going to have uh, thousands of families in high rental areas where they'll get about an extra $100 a week, some of them, depending on their income, uh, to help them with those housing costs. So that's going to have a significant impact. Uh, Prime Minister, you know, we, we, you've talked about uh, benefits for older and younger. One of the big issues, of course, uh, that's had, had a lot of traction for yourselves in terms of boot camps. Uh, and uh, some calls, I mean, uh, Māori Party uh, talking about, uh, you know, the boot camp perpetuating injustice and abuse uh, towards our uh, Māori and Pasifika people. New Zealand First saying it's a bit of a, a U-turn, you know, after uh, nine years where, that there wasn't a problem with youth justice. Can you talk to us more about uh, uh, boot camps and, uh, you know, the role that it will play in terms of helping those of our uh, most vulnerable or at-risk youth? We are uh, digging down to get to the most difficult social problems in our community. And you've got a number of schemes around the country that are going literally family by family. I know in Mangari there's one happening where... There's a group there going along a couple of streets finding out just which families are in which houses and exactly what pressures they're under. Uh, the same in Tamaki, where there's a high concentration of Pacific people uh, going family by family to sort out what issues are going to help change their lives. Now, one of those issues that sometimes is youth offending. Uh, and the discussion about boot camp um, is a discussion about 150 of the worst youth offenders. These are young people who've committed murder, rape, aggravated robbery. And what we've done is give them an alternative to prison. So these are young people who've already been through the courts. They've been sentenced to sometimes up to 14 years in prison. And we said, right, instead of going to prison, uh, we're going to put you through this scheme for a year uh, with intensive wraparound services, including um, intervention with your family, if that's the problem so that we can try and change something. Because if we just send them off to prison, uh, they learn how to be criminals there. Now, the the reason it got called boot camp is because some of it will be run by the army uh, who are quite experienced dealing with young people who need some structure uh, and some discipline. And these just aren't your average wayward youth. These are serious offenders. But we've also got a range of other things to deal with young people to keep them on track because it's so important and often when I'm standing up in front of classrooms uh, where we see Pacifica kids I keep saying to them each one of you is important to your families you're also important to us and uh, we're getting more and more getting better at working out down to the individual child individual young person to either through their school or through other services that if they're getting in a bit of trouble we want to keep each one of them on track and uh, very good morning, Prime Minister. And talking about uh, youth and our young Pacifica people, issues of around mental health, suicide rates, uh, the pressure of the internet, social media. Uh, do you believe that we've got the right programs and have we got the right people working in these fields, in these areas to help our communities? 
day, I don't think we've got all the right programs yet, that's for sure, because there's still a good deal of concern about how our young people deal with anxiety and depression. And for some of these kids in the Pacific community, it's quite, you know, quite hard for them to talk about it. Uh, on the one hand, their opportunities have never been better. Uh, you know, I just look at all the work that's coming available in Auckland over the next 10 years. If a young person wants to pursue any kind of trade or professional or technical career uh, uh, in related to construction, it's, there's 10 years of work out there uh, and they will almost certainly get a job. On the other hand, I'm pleased you raised the issue of social media uh, because I've noticed, observed through my own children and their peer group how young people these days can be getting criticised and ripped by others who, who they've never met. Not only are they not in their family or in their community, they've never met them, but they're getting abused because of their, their picture on Facebook's not cool. Uh, and that, I think, has quite can have quite an effect on some young people. So have we got the right uh, schemes in there? We've just launched another round or a new round of programs because we need to do better for these young people than just hope that they'll go off to the traditional hospital-based mental health service. So we're putting more into schools. Uh, we're going to be putting, uh, getting more done with the police when they have uh, contact with people over mental health, mental health issues, which is quite a lot. We need to make sure there's someone there who's expert and actually avoids ongoing contact with the police because they can deal with the problem. The third thing which I'm hoping is going to be proved to be effective is e-therapy. So that is programs delivered on the internet on kids' phones. The research tells us that the that can be as effective as face-to-face counselling. And uh, I know one of the, for some publicity about one of the Pacifica organisations that's going to be doing some of these programs, uh, LEVA, which is a very well-run, very professional organisation in Auckland, uh, trying to find these different ways of reaching people. Uh, Prime Minister, just to stay on this a, a little bit, uh, because of course we're streaming uh, live on Facebook now, and uh, I, I want to uh, touch on an article from the Herald uh, dated the 17th of uh, July this year with regards to a recommendation of a panel of experts uh, for reducing New Zealand's total suicide rate by 20% over 10 years, and yet this recommendation uh, was not taken on board, and even the current Minister of Health, uh, Jonathan and Coleman, our current approach to youth suicide and not working, uh, which scares me. Uh, I, I want to add on to this the, uh, a question from one of our uh, viewers on Facebook. Uh, youth suicide, Pacific youth, three times more likely to commit suicide than European youth. What do you think are the, the major causes? You know, and I, I know you've talked already on, on some of the programs, but you know, addressing this uh, this. A uh, horrific epidemic, if you will. I mean, you know, looking at the glo- at the New Zealand average of suicide rates uh, being so high that it drives the global uh, suicide ev- uh, suicide rates high. It, it, it's it's a very very sad case at, at the moment. Your thoughts on that, Prime Minister? Well, I've had a bit to do with suicides, and what I can what we can say is it's very it's hard to say these particular causes. Uh, because in the end, someone makes their own internal decision for reasons that we usually can't understand uh, to take their own life. And uh, when we look at the causes, you know, when we look at where suicide happens, it can still be hard to pin down the causes. What so uh, or explain any particular suicide? So the general approach, the way I've seen it work. Um, and is this importance of focusing on young people's resilience. That is, when something happens that does genuinely upset them and you'd expect it to, that they know what to do to deal with it. And if, when you hear stories of, say, some young, young guy who committed suicide because his girlfriend left him when he was 16, uh, then you know that he needs better ways of coping. It could be that he has just been unable to talk about it could be that uh, he just needs someone to say to him, well, look, it's not the end of the world if your girlfriend leaves you. We think you can handle it. It could be that kind of reassurance. Um, so getting young, starting fairly early with building young people's resilience to things going wrong is personally what I think makes the most difference in the long run. 
But then, of course, there are those examples where there have been signs that a teacher might have missed or parents might have missed. Uh, those, uh, in those cases, you just want all the adults to be tuned in to what um, looks like someone on the path to taking their own life. It's a dreadful thing. It's shocking when it happens. Doesn't matter how often it happens. It's shocking, and uh, you know we're willing to take the measures we believe can be effective to help. But of course, government can't do it on its own because we're not close to these young people. Uh, government is just a you know agencies and money with good intentions, um, but it can get alongside the um, communities, the families, the schools, the peer group who can have some influence. Uh, Prime Minister, uh, a change of tack now, uh, another question from one of our Facebook viewers with regards to your stance or National Party stance on the living wage and why you changed the law on pay equity. We changed the law, the law we brought in the law on pay equity. There's a bit of confusion about this. You might remember there was an employment argument going on between the rest home workers and the home rest home and home care workers, of whom there's a lot of uh, Pacific women involved. And uh, they have recently, that, that, uh, that contract dispute was settled. Um, we could afford it because the government's got good surpluses. So it's cost about $2 billion over four years for 55,000 women. And they get a well-deserved pay rise of around 20 up to 30%. And that happened on the 1st of July. So there are people getting up today, going to rest home to work, and they are getting paid 20% more for some of those women. It's $100 a week, depending on you know whether they're full-time or part-time. And we are pleased about that. Everyone's pleased about it. Others want to go... Others believe they've got a case for the same kind of increase. That's why we put into Parliament pay equity legislation that allows other groups, like, say, the mental health workers to make a claim, and that claim will then be dealt with, uh, particularly if the government's if the government is the ultimate employer, then the government ends up um, paying it out. So we're pleased about the step forward. Others, we couldn't settle everybody at once. 55,000 low-income women have had a 20% pay increase, and others will. And again, I must, I, you know, I want to stress because the government has got its books are in good shape, they're able to pay for. You know, 600,000 more people getting GP visits were able to pay this pay equity settlement for 55,000 women. Prime Minister, uh, just going back to uh, earlier, we were talking about the uh, issues around our young Pacifica uh, community. Look, we've been told time and time again, you've probably heard this as well, young people disengaged, not interested in politics, and just issues like this that you're talking about, so important, pay equity. Um, we've got more than 200,000 eligible voters, most of them youth, not registered. What needs to happen? And our, our uh, MPs... Um, are you out of touch with youth? And is it just youth that you're out of touch with, you believe? Uh, no, I don't. Um, look, if the youth, young people, regardless of who the government is, have just have lower rates of voting because they're not that interested. Uh, they're just living their lives, doing the things they want to do. They don't necessarily understand, or even if they do, they don't really care how the politics connects to them. We try, of course, to... Um, uh, to, to work with young people, and I enjoy the opportunity myself. I get to, we get to meet thousands, hundreds of them, uh, and I just say to them that they're, they're, we're working, we care about each one of them, and their opportunities to get jobs or fulfil their talents have never have never been better in New Zealand for a long time. And we're, you know, I'm always so pleased to see the confidence and the competence of the of our young people as they. Uh, leave school, get into the workforce, go into training. Uh, I enjoy their company and like working with them. Uh, <clears throat> now, when you say, um, I mean, the other question was whether we're, you know, out of touch with others. No, I think the answer to that is no, and that's why you're seeing the actions that we're taking to deal with the pressures that they face. You know, on the 1st of April next year, uh, the family incomes package that we put out will reduce child poverty in New Zealand by... 30%. One third fewer children will be under the international poverty line. That's real success. We tend to do that. Uh, we've had 60, over 60,000 children today 
60,000 fewer children today wake up in a household where the parent is on welfare rather than work. So 60,000 for 60,000 kids, compared to five years ago, their parents going to work, they're not on welfare. And then there's other areas where you know we've un- we're making changes which are starting to have an impact. So we've just had our first ever Pacific Group register as a community housing provider. So instead of just being the occupants of our state houses, we are now going to have Pacific people operating, managing those houses and owning them. And I think that is a big step forward. It's going to take some time. But we do understand the, understand the pressures that people are under and we want to use the opportunity of having this economy that's going well to make sure, to do our best to get young people into work uh, and to get more cash in the pockets of our households, whether it's the rest home worker who's just had the pay rise, the superannuitant who can now get the cheaper doctor visits, uh, or the family that are working hard but have huge rental bills and they're going to get uh, another $100 a week from the 1st of April. Prime Minister, we you, you, you talk about housing and in terms of your uh, policy around affordable housing with net addition to housing stock, looking at approximately 26,000 homes. We're looking at Auckland, a mixed social and private housing. In terms of being able to effectively monitor developers to ensure that they will actually meet the quota of social housing with uh, recent... Uh, articles uh, talking about uh, the lack of transparency uh, so far, uh, you know, with uh, developers in terms of meeting that social housing quota? Well, they'll be monitored and uh, they'll have to meet their contractual obligations. And there is, you're making a very good point here. We're going into a phase of large scale house building, whether it's the private market, whether the government, as you say, the government's going to have a Net, uh, you know, it's actually totally in, well, in Auckland is going to build 35,000 new houses over the next 10 years. So a great opportunity for jobs there and uh, lots of people are going to end up with nice new houses who, who currently don't like the ones they're in. And so that'll all have to be done in a fully transparent way. I haven't, I haven't actually read the articles you're referring to, but um, I'll go and find them because uh, it's not going to work. You know, that, that must be one of the newer examples of one of the examples of trying to get up and do these things on a bigger scale. And, uh, of course, you want it to be transparent. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Prime Minister, in terms of special housing areas. I, I know there's been houses earmarked uh, for out in uh, South Auckland, but uh, the majority of special or housing are being built in an area out in West Auckland that uh, currently doesn't have strong infrastructure. R- reasoning uh, around this? There's uh, about a billion dollars is being provided to the councils, including I think 300 million for Auckland, and with more to come, to p- help the council pay the bills for whatever roads and pipes are needed. In fact, the council don't let you build the houses unless the roads and pipes are in place or going to be in place. And we've got the whole system's got much better at that because so many houses are being built. I think over the next five years, is 200,000 houses are going to be built across New Zealand in the next six years. Uh, that's lots of jobs for people to build them, but also means we're going to be building lots of roads and pipes uh, to go with it. And, that's, and that includes the um, rebuilding of uh, renewal of a lot of the state housing areas uh, where there already is infrastructure, but we do need a higher quality of housing. I'm going to have to go and catch a plane. Well, uh, Prime Minister, we did have more, but uh, we would just like to thank you so much for your time this morning and uh, uh, wishing you and the team all the best in the lead-up uh, to the uh, election come uh, 23rd of September. Whafatai tēlu lava, and to have a great day. Thank you. Well, whafatai tēlu lava to your listeners, and uh, I just hope that they can get out and vote. And Some of them don't always think about voting national, uh, but the work we're doing, I think, with the housing, with the young people, uh, the real aspirations I see among so many Pacifica families, they should just give it a thought. Thanks. Thank you so much. The Prime Minister of New Zealand and the leader of the National Party, the Honourable Liu Lua'i Ali'i uh, Gladys.
Well, well, one thing that we didn't get to touch on that, that I, I'm going to bring up anyway, the Māori Party talking about the immigration, uh, their policy, looking at uh, amnesty for overstayers from the Pacific Islands and uh, just looking at you know, the, the, the policies uh, for uh, national in this area, nothing similar. But uh, again, uh, how'd you go? Uh, yes, your thoughts? Um, I guess, I mean, it's good that uh, first off uh, the, the rank, uh, we've got uh, the uh, the leader of the National Party, but the Prime Minister coming on board. And, and um, you know, he is a seasoned politician yeah. uh, over 30 years and uh, he's been in the game for quite a long time. So uh, making sure that that message gets out, of course, that'll be key for him in these next four weeks, making sure they've got strong policy. Um, obviously, uh, the challenge, like you said, is to get people out there to vote, regardless of what political party or your mm. stance there is. Um, and it is about making sure that people understand the information. Um, it is a lot to take in, uh, the uh, different policies and what these parties are offering. Uh, and uh, so, like you said, get out and vote. And on that note, uh, a very big thank you. And Gladys, thank you so much for setting your alarm clock three times just to get here this morning so at an earlier myself. time. You are, man, I'm going to call you Brown Sugar Gladys uh, for today. Thank you so much. I like it. <laughs> It is uh, 17 minutes to 8, and oh my goodness, I've got another interview uh, ready to go. I'll be uh, going up uh, very shortly, and uh, yes.